Hi, it's been a little while since I made a video, um, having some space issues on my computer, but uh, it may actually be that it's better to be a bit more selective anyway, rather than making a video every time I have thoughts about something, um, because that way I can perhaps put a little bit more um, of a thought process in the, in the individual videos. But this one I think is important. Um, and it's about the concept of an echo chamber. That is, if you sort of go into a forum, and I'm particularly thinking of the online sense here, uh, if you go into a forum and it's basically a consensus opinion, or rather, um, because I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with a consensus opinion, but rather it's um, a sort of pressure of a way of thinking that everyone conforms to. I personally think you can find this um, politically on the left and the right. Um, but in terms of woke dogma, in terms of cancel culture, it's more the domain of the left. But I wouldn't say the right is immune from it either. Um, so I want to talk just a bit about how I approach this. And you'll excuse me if I... Don't usually go for a white wine, actually. Usually prefer red, but that's just a change. It's kind of nice early evening wine. Um, seafood, of course, I've just had some cockles, which are nice with that. But anyway, um, I've always sort of had this conscientious inner little push to think critically to think outside the box now i'm not implying that i don't derive comfort from finding common ground because i do it's it's nice when you find that you have common ground with someone it's nice when uh, people give you a claim or you find something in them that is inspiring and uplifting and refreshing in an argument that they're making so i won't deny it's um given a choice of finding common ground versus very rigorous confrontation i'll probably choose the former but rigorous confrontation is part of debate that's totally natural it's part of it so i i always find myself self-aware if i go to a particular writer or thinker public figure and I respect them and I agree with them, I'm always careful not to fall into the trap of idolizing them. And I think this is quite easy to do. And again, I think it happens from left and right. Um, if I were to quote a few figures that are sort of uh, representative of the, the backlash against woke dogma. People like, um, there's quite a few, uh, Douglas Murray, I've just watched an interview with David Starkey. Talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, who else do we have? Uh, Lawrence Fox, mixed views on. I'm not sure he's as much of a heavyweight as some of the others, intellectually speaking. Uh, nevertheless, I think he's got about an interesting um, focus because he's a celebrity. Um, and there's others. Sam Harris, I'm not that familiar with. I really need to look at more of Sam Harris's work. Uh, a friend of mine, um, not a close friend, but I'm friendly with her, Melissa Chen, uh, is a New York editor of uh, The Spectator USA. Um, I think she has some very refreshing ideas. There's others. There's others. Um, what I'm always aware of is I find what these people have to say refreshing and interesting. Uh, Jordan Peterson would be another example. But... Even then, I'm always cautious not to slavishly agree with them. And this is where we get into the test of the echo chamber. You know, most people want their comfort zone. Most people want to find common ground. And, you know, it's a thing about confirmation bias. If you are in a forum where everyone has a similar political outlook to yourself, that, that's going to be a sense of empowerment you're going to think well these people feel the same way i do and like i say i don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with that 
because there might be a trajectory. I do think that there is a genuine backlash against woke ideology. Um, I should say this interview with David Starkey, uh, who doesn't really need an introduction. He's a prominent British historian. And last year he got basically cancelled because of a flippant remark he made on black people. He was talking about the slave trade. He was talking about the context of how he didn't see it as um, comparable to the Shoah, to the Jewish Holocaust. Um, and basically he, he was quite flippant in the way he described it. He said there was too many, and this is verbatim, too many damn blacks in America. Now he has totally admitted that that was a flippant thing to say and it was very stupid to say it the way he did. But he got absolutely destroyed for that. Now the interesting thing about this interview was it was with Peter Whittle, who was one of the founders of this think tank, the New Culture Forum, I believe it's called. Um, I'll put a link to the video. Interesting thing about Starkey was he was downplaying the effect this had, which I don't quite agree with because I think that he is, um, you know, he's being stoic. He's saying it didn't bother me, but he said on the day itself it was unpleasant. That is when he was, uh, I think, sacked from Cambridge University. Um, but I, I think he's starting playing the effect that this has in terms of how woke ideology is infecting our institutions. I actually touched on it himself. He touched on this corporate woke, which is powerful. Now, he personally is saying that it's just words and he's stoic. That That's good, but maybe it's because he's a public figure. And actually, Douglas Murray touched on this as well. Public figures can kind of weather the storm a bit more. Now, if you're a regular person, let's say you are, I don't know, a civil servant, or you are perhaps working in a company, and there's a company meeting on diversity and equality, and you raise issues which perhaps goes a bit against the grain, and then you're pulled aside. I've heard, for example, of teachers being reprimanded and even um, dismissed because they question critical race theory. Now, they're not leading act academics, they're not best-selling authors, they're just ordinary people who took issue with that particular narrative. So I do think to some extent public figures can weather the storm because they're already famous. You know, David Starkey was already famous, so there will always be people who will defend him. Uh, on the other hand, you get someone like Will Nolan who wasn't famous, um, and I guess this is something encouraging, because when he got cancelled for his uh, lecture on patriarchy, or rather questioning the feminist narrative on that, he got quite a lot of support. So that's something encouraging, particularly in this country. There is a backlash against this. It's easy to be dystopian and think it's out of control, we're living in a sort of cultural revolution and people just get cancelled and that's it, their lives and their careers are over. But there is a real backlash. And Starkey mentioned something interesting, which I agree with. He said that actually among the young, there's a bit of a gender divide on this because young men, boys, are starting to turn against it. And that could be the feminism factor. It could be the constant male shaming from that. They're tired of being shamed. So all's not over. I think actually the, the key to this is to accept that you will be called a racist, you will be called a uh, misogynist and all the rest of it. The woke left are very good at tagging labels to people. You know, it doesn't matter that that's factually incorrect, but they, they will do that. And I think for people who really want to challenge this, who know that it needs to be challenged, they have to be prepared to, I think it takes some courage actually, be prepared to get stigmatised in that way. But I think the key is to not lose self-control, stick to your guns, and to just argue rationally and objectively, and don't give them ammo. Um, because if you argue with facts and truth, at some point that will prevail. So I'm actually cautiously optimistic about the situation in this country. In the United States, I think it's more intense. Um, what Starkey mentioned, and I, I think he's right about this again, is that um, the American dynamic is different. It's utterly split down the middle. I think more so, I think more so than Britain. Um, you know, along Democratic and Republican lines. But 
a lot of the terminology we use in the UK now, or rather the woke left uses, an example being white privilege, that's actually from the American left. That isn't from the British left. That's from the American left, but the British left have adopted it, or the British woke left, I should say. Um, because one thing about the culture wars, I think, read, needs to be really, really underlined. It's not as simple as left versus right. It's really not. Now, I identify as a centrist. And this is getting back to the echo chamber thing. I insist, I absolutely insist, that I do not answer to anyone but myself. I don't, I don't owe the right anything. I don't owe the left anything. So this is an interesting little example. And I admit it's not perhaps a popular approach. But if I look at a video of David Starkey, you know, the comments are all supportive. And I'm broadly supportive. I think he raised a lot of good points. But there was one part of the interview I did not agree with. And he was criticising the government's approach to COVID. He made a good point about the police kind of flip-flopping from overreach to underreach. But here's my issue with that sort of statement. Um, he was talking about the, the argument on liberalism and it's a Chinese virus and we've become a Chinese society. I don't entirely agree with that because I think it's an exceptional event. And here's, here's my issue with Starkey's position there. It's fine to criticise the government. It's fine to say it's overreach, but what's the alternative? What You know, it's fine to criticise, but you need to then say, well, what would you do, David Starkey, if you were Prime Minister? Would you have no restrictions whatsoever? So this is what I'm driving at with thinking outside the echo chamber, because a lot of people go into that video would say, oh, he's absolutely right about that. And maybe that's a sincere, sincere view, but I'm thinking, well, actually, I do disagree with that, and I'm going to say so, and it might not make me popular. But I, I will not slavishly agree with anyone. There are people I respect, and and I think that they they raise very valid points. But even I'll, I'll quote Douglas Murray. Um, Murray, again, is someone I think is very smart. He has some very compelling arguments. Um, I've got his book. In fact, I shall show it. The Madness of Crowds. I haven't started it yet, but it should be a good read. It's got good reviews. Um, you know, I think Douglas Murray is a very intelligent man, and I think he's got a lot of uh, important points to make. He's been smeared as a far-right activist, which is, from what I can see, has very little evidence. But um, he did say one thing which I didn't agree with. John Major, former Prime Minister John Major, was giving his views on Brexit. He was simply giving his views. And Murray had a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to that. He said, uh, I think the last thing the British people want here is John Major's opinion. Well, freedom of expression, if you really believe in that, then you can't sort of take the view that because someone's a public figure um, and they're on the losing side of a referendum, then their view is utterly invalid. One of the things I most dislike about Brexit is the way it's tribalised people to, you know, leave people think we won, therefore the other side need to shut up. And there are hardcore remainers who don't accept democracy. I think both positions are wrong. So those hardcore remainers, they have to accept democracy. They have to accept that the mandate was for the lead side. On the other hand, I don't like this um, dogma from certain leavers that anyone who raises any concerns whatsoever about Brexit and about the way it's going is a traitor. So that's why I don't think that cancel culture is totally a domain of the left. I do think there, I think it's less pronounced on the right, but I do think there is a bit of intolerance on the right as well. And they might deny it, but there is. For example, um, well, that's an example. The whole Brexit dogma that if you have someone expressing concerns about Brexit and they say, they point to, for example, the riots in Northern Ireland or something else as saying, well, actually, there are question marks over this, then they're immediately pounced on. Immediately, kind of, it's implied that they are non patriotic. I think that's wrong. A referendum mandate doesn't mean that the other side suddenly lose the right to free speech. And I do think there are some hardcore leavers that have that mentality. 
that because they won, then the other side just needs to shut up. What the other side needs to do is accept that they won. They need to accept democracy. But we did not lose the right to have an opinion in, um, when was it, June 2016. And that's why I've grown very suspicious of referendums, because all they do is divide society. Same with Scotland. After 2014, Scotland became bitterly divided. Um, depending on what happens in this election, it may well be that the SNP wins a majority. They probably will. And then they'll be pushing for another referendum. I hope that doesn't happen. I do think the British government would still be within its rights to refuse, but politically it will be harder. Um, part of me almost wants it on the grounds that I think I think it'll be closer than before, but I still think the majority of Scots will reject independence. Part of me wants that in order to just say this is this is over for a generation. You know, you've had two referendums and that's it. But I think, generally speaking, referendums are not a good thing, except in extreme circumstances, because what these referendums have shown. The European Union referendum of 2016 and the Scottish referendum of 2014 is that they are very, very divisive. They tribalise people. I mean, before 2016, the divisions between people who were pro and anti-EU was a lot less pronounced, I would say. It was there, but it was less pronounced. It's only got worse. So that's unfortunate. Now, I voted Remain. I accept the result. I'm not a remoaner. I'm not demanding a second referendum. But I do maintain my right to express dissent if I think this is going south. And I think so far it's a mixed, it's kind of a mixed record. We have got some uh, important trade deals. Um, Liz Truss has, I think she's been quite a good minister in that sense. Uh, trade deals with Japan and other countries have to be welcomed. And our vaccine rollout rate compared to other EU countries has been very successful. On the other hand, um, also Union has failed the trade. And there are major constitutional question marks now. So is, it, is it a success? I honestly think it's just too early to say. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up soon. But I think it's so, so important that we think critically. And part of that means being prepared to sometimes question our own side. So I'm very uh, critical of the woke left at the moment. But that does not mean that I am going to absolutely endorse everything their critics say. I'm not going to outright dismiss, for example, let's take the race report recently, the government's much criticised race report. I haven't read it. So I'm not in a position to say it's absolutely right or it's absolutely wrong. But I do feel that um, it's important to be open-minded on things like that. So, for example, um, to say that the UK situation is comparable to the American situation, also, to say that there is widespread institutional racism in this country, I think is very questionable. By the same token, though, we cannot say that we don't have racism. We do. I think most people acknowledge that. But there will be some on the right who say that that's not a problem, that it doesn't happen. And they will, for example, if someone has been a victim of a race hate crime, they will question it. That's wrong. We should be sympathetic. We should be compassionate enough to accept that these things do happen. And there are some very ignorant people in society. But I also think there's a difference between an individual suffering racist abuse versus it being deeply ingrained and institutionalised in society. I think there's a huge difference. Anyway, with that said, I'm I'm proud to be um, a free thinker in the ideological sense. I stand up for what I believe in. I try to anyway, and I can't know everything. I don't pretend I know everything. People who are smarter than me, who know more than me, and I'm humble enough to admit that. I do try to think critically. I do try to look at different perspectives. And I just think it's so critical to not follow into the, fall into the echo chamber. Just to quote another example, 
take Russia today, for example. Um, I'm fiercely critical of RT. I can't stand it. I think it's a mouthpiece of the Kremlin. But they are very much, um, you know, you look at RT videos, the comment section is almost universally towing the line of Russian state media. It's almost universally made up of conspiracy theorists, people who believe that when it comes to the West and Russia, the West is the aggravating factor, um, and people who admire Putin. It's, you know, it's very predictable, very predictable. Um, you also get this with, uh, I'm very critical of people who claim to be freelance journalists, but who end up being stooges for totalitarian regimes. So the Canadian journalist Eva Bartlett, you know, there's certain circles and there's certain um, forums where she is absolutely hailed as a truth teller. Why? Because she questions Western foreign policy. I don't think she's brave. I don't think she's revolutionary. I think she is just another mouthpiece for a dictatorship. Claims to be independent, but she she really was a propagandist for Bashar Assad. John Pilger, the much admired Australian veteran journalist, has now become a uh, part of that contingent of he's far more experienced than Eva Bartlett, but you know, he's sort of there, there's an example of someone who's very experienced, so people think he's therefore above reproach. But in recent years, it's very clear that Pilger, in his personal animosity towards Western foreign policy, I think it's blinded him. I think it's made him become a bit, a bit of a best man for Russia. He'll deny it, of course. But if you look at some of the things that he comes out with, it's also true of the late Robert Fisk of the Independent. Um, and there was such a thing as Fisking, which was a term in journalism which sort of described... Um, questioning material evidence you know in terms of implicating Assad's role in barrel bombing and the chemical attacks uh, Fisk put a different narrative on it but I do think certain journalists um, start to allow their ideological biases to get in the way and I think two prime examples are Robert Fisk and John Pilger uh, now I'm I'm training to be a freelance journalist I'm not going to say that I won't have biases but I'll be damn sure that anything I say will be evidence-based. Uh, and I won't be pushing... <sighs> I have to be very careful not to push. You know, I say I won't, but who knows if I'm corrupted by the industry or not. I'll try very hard to just work with the facts that are available. Anyway, I'll round this up. But that's my thoughts. It's comfortable to follow into the in, uh, excuse me to fall into the echo chamber. That's comfortable. It's understandable. But I think it's very, very, very important that we try to temper it at least to some extent to always question, to always question, and not just to idolize people just because they make strong arguments. Nobody, nobody can know everything, and nobody is right about everything. So that's something to think about. Thanks for watching.